All right, we're going to go ahead and call the committee of the whole meeting to order. It is Tuesday, February 12th at 7 p.m. First item on the agenda is roll call, please. Rosado? Here. Atac? Here. Stark? Here. Chancet? Here. Wolf? Here. Salvati? Here. Brown? Here. O'Brien? Callahan? Here. Meitzler? Here. Malay? Here. Ewer? Cerrone? Here. And McFadden? Here. Okay, so we do have a quorum. Next item is item two, which is a reminder, of course, to make sure we use our microphones so that we can be recorded and those at home that are listening can hear what we uh, have got to say. Item three is approval of the minutes for January 15th, 2019. Anybody have any comments or questions on those minutes? Hearing none, can I get a motion? So moved. Second. <clears throat> motion by, was that Stark? Mm -hmm. And second by Millay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Both. Motion's carried. Item four, items removed, added, or changed. The only thing that we've got is we're going to add on to item number 14 under project status is the communications report from Chris Cudworth. Anybody else have anything else? Okay. Item five, matters from the public. There's no one here from the public. <laughs> item six, consent agenda. Item A, which is resolution 19-019-R, Authorizing execution of a one-year renewable contract with WA Management for the 2019 East Side Property Maintenance. The memo came out of Scott Haynes, and I'm sure everybody's had a chance to read it. Alderman uh, Wolf, you have comments on that one? Just a real simple, it's only $743 increased over this year. Um, had no problems with them, and uh, it's very interesting to see the other uh, quote there that's over double that. I mean, as long as we're getting done what we need to have done, and stay with that. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Motion by Star, second by Callahan. Metzler, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's carried. <coughs> Item 7, Ordinance 19-05, annexing and zoning parts of Main Street and Deer Path Road right away. Memo, memo from Scott Buning and Alderman Stark. Uh, thanks, Dave. So this is for the continuing improvements at Main Street and Deer Path Road. So the city acquired the parcels in 2018 as part of that intersection improvement. And so the annexation now ensures the continuity of jurisdiction so that the city of Batavia has jurisdiction over all of that property. The property is zoned R0 upon annexation and no rezoning is contemplated until possibly the um, adjacent property is developed. So we can annex it or not annex it. Those are our alternatives. Your budget impact is about $400 for the plats of annexation and recording costs. And there's no impact on staffing other than time. And um, does anyone have any questions of Scott about that? Barring none, would someone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by McFadden, second by Lay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. <coughs> that can go on the consent agenda. Consent agenda. Okay. Item 8, Resolution 19-012-R, authorizing King County 2019 Community Development Block Grant application. Alderman Stark. Um, sounds good. So every year, um, Kane County has community development block grants, <clears throat> and every year we try to get some of the money from the grant. And it is good for... Um, the low income part of Batavia, which always makes me laugh because that's like an oxymoron in itself. But <clears throat> the funding this year um, is for resurfacing and ADA compliance work for uh, sections of Church Street in the Fourth Ward, Columbia, and Fayette. And the total cost of the project is $78,109. And Scott and his team are requesting a grant of $47,000 of that amount. The city would co contribute $31,000. Um, there's a short timeline for submittal, and the deadline is February 8th, <clears throat> yeah, which was passed. <laughs> That's typical with, mm -hmm. uh, with these grants. And so um, this will be on <clears throat> the city council agenda on February 18th. Uh, the county has previously indicated that the resolution may come after the city council votes on it, um, as long as you know we all agree that we should submit it. So um, does anybody have any questions about this? We do seem to do this just about every year. We apply for this block grant, and it has helped improve different things in the fourth ward, so I'm all in favor of it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions of Scott about it? Tony? Just curious, uh, the uh, ADA compliance, is, are we talking uh, sidewalks? Sidewalks. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. 
That's what I figured. The curb cut and stuff. Yeah, we have to when we do a pave repave and we have to put ramps in mm -hmm. and comply. Perfect. Yeah, I'm all in favor. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Someone like to make a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Malay, second by Cerrone. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion also carries. Consent? Sure. Okay. Thank Next you. four items. Thank you, Scott. Next four items, um, item number 9, 10, 11, and 12, all fall under government services. First one is resolution 19-014-R, 2018 tax abatement. Alderman Atec. Yes, these four um, resolutions are to abate the levy for the bonds that the city chooses to pay from the um, from other sources, which um, resolution 19-14-R is for the general obligation bonds for um, the fire station, and we're going to abate with sales tax. Resolution 19-15-R is for the IEPA refunding, and we're going to rebate with water sewer revenue. 19-16-R is for electric refunding, and we'll use the electric revenue for as a source of an abatement. And resolution 19-17-R um, is for general obligation bonds for um, drainage for the CF capital, and we'll use the general, I mean CH capital, we'll use the general fund for that. So if there aren't any questions, I will um, move that we approve resolution 19 dash 14-R to abate um, the levy for the bonds to pay for the fire states, general obligation bonds. Second. Oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Do you have any comments, Peggy? I should have asked you beforehand. <laughs> I didn't. No. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, Lucy? Yes. How many? Uh, um, who was the second on that? We had McDermott as the maker of the motion? No, he no, no I think Lucy, Lucy. I made the motion. Lucy, happen, made, yeah, the Lucy motion. made the motion. Yeah. That's why I was like, oh. <clears throat> I guess I should. I'm sorry. I should have okay. asked someone else to make the motion. Peggy, how many years are left on the fire station? Uh, they will be uh, 2025. Okay, thank you. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve resolution 19-15-R? So moved. Second. All in favor? Hi. Aye. Would um, the motion passes? Would someone like to make a motion to approve resolution 19-16-R? So, so moved. Move. Second. Uh, Only in mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Resolution 19-17-R. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. And a real, real quick question before we get off of the subject. Um, if we were not to abate these, they would not be subject to the property tax cap or anything else if we were to just leave them or take them from property taxes, right? We could add these over and above a regular increase to property taxes? That's correct. correct. Okay. Because they're general obligation bonds. This is we had talked about it briefly mm -hmm. when we were going through the home rule process. These were the bonds okay. that we are abating that we <clears throat> wouldn't have to because they wouldn't be subject to the tax cap. So that would have been could or could have been a three three point seven million dollar increase in property taxes. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to talk about that again because I think that that's something to remember that you know that's the reality of the way we pay a lot of this stuff off that we're not using that money or only one of them is from the general fund but we're not using that out of property tax money basically that's correct so that's to remind her yep. mm -hmm. okay that it lucy yes okay we'll go to item 13 resolution 19-19-021-r authorized authorization for an amount not to exceed ninety eight thousand six hundred and eighty dollars fifty seven cents to purchase Cisco network equipment for upgrading city supervisory control and data acquisition. In other words, it's called SCADA. Systems for electric water and wastewater utilities. Alderman Chanzik. Okay, so uh, we did authorize this last year. This was uh, putting money towards combining all three of the utilities onto one system. And for those that aren't familiar with the SCADA, that's the system that instantly notifies uh, city staff when there are irregularities uh, with the electric water or wastewater 
uh, systems. Um, if you look at the memo, the uh, costs are spread out among all three of the utilities. Um, of note is the electric utility is, is uh, replacing some nine-year-old equipment, and the other three utilities are of the, all three of them are going to be uh, sharing the other one server. Um, also in the memo, it was noted that uh, if we had to, did I get this right? That if we were going to buy this from the state of Illinois, it was like fifty thousand dollars more. So it had our we just went to the company direct and said, "Hey, how much you got?" It had our yeah. head scratching a little bit. All we can imagine is maybe the state bid, maybe like really old. Like even even a year old or whatever, and then since then electronics have come down. But honestly, we don't, we can't explain it. Okay. It's our only guy. I can I can explain. I can explain. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't want too many opinions on that one. Spring. But yes, <laughs> technically the the state bid, which you wouldn't have, you could you don't have to wait bids for. You could award through the state bid. That's called and pay one hundred fifty six thousand, or you can essentially you're going to have to waive bids, but you can pay ninety eight thousand. So figure that out. For those that aren't familiar, what types of warnings does a SCADA system give you guys advance notice of? So this will be the three different utilities. Um, so like on the wastewater side, it might be like a lift station has failed or, or is off. So the water is rising in the lift station. On the water side, it might be that the pump or the pumps are on or off or the water tower levels are low. In fact, that's how we found a water main, that we had a water main break earlier this year. And the electric side, it's things like power outages. Uh, if there are no questions, we did authorize this last year. This is just to go ahead and make the purchase. Uh, if there are no other questions or discussion, I would uh, move that we approve resolution 1921R, authorizing us to spend an, an amount not to exceed $98,680.57. Second. <clears throat> um, motion and a second. Any other discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Our motion passes. So that'll have to go on regular agenda. Yep. We'll have an approval item to waive formal bidding. Because of how we spent the money. <laughs> yeah. We're waiving formal bidding to get out of the state bid, which is saving us $50,000. And for, <laughs> certainly nice to talk about because yeah, it's a great system. Hey, yeah. If I may just, sorry, one comment that I probably should have brought up sooner. It, just to point out, too, the consolidation from three separate systems to one system, it doesn't put all three systems at risk if, if there's a problem then because there's redundancy in this one yeah, system, this correct? Right. That's what I was, okay. Just wanted to clarify that as well, so. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jerry. All right, item 14, project status. Uh, Laura, are you going to start us out with that? Sure. Um, I'd invite Chris Cudworth to come up. Um, so we, what we like to do is once every six months offer the department heads an opportunity to share with all of you um, what progress that they have made over the last period. This will be, um, Chris is going to talk about the accomplishments from the communications department over the course of the last year and then looking forward to some of the projects that he has ongoing for this year. I just want to mention at the beginning of the presentation that it was in the 2017 budget that this position was created. Created, um, and to increase not only our outbound communication, but also our engagement with the community. And so I think you'll see a lot of things in Chris's presentation that um, up to this point that we, we struggled with the ability to provide this level of communication. So um, Chris, I'll just turn it over to you to show. Yes, thank you. And uh, I'll do a brief preface here because um, in my original involvement in the city of Batavia from the a chamber in the Rotary. I recall a guy came to town named Bert Stitt that did a rather aggressive um, assessment of the state of the city of Batavia. And what I found remarkable about that uh, period of time was that uh, coming out of that, uh, it wasn't a straight line effect that took place. Uh, some of the things that uh, people considered almost insulting to our city were um, sort of set aside, but what came out of it was a really, really great forward moving project in the form of the Batavia River Walk, which involved so many aspects of the community, brought volunteers together, um, you know, basically created a, an entire new amenity uh, for this community. And I think about that as um, I go about the work of doing communications for the city of Batavia every day and watching the city council and the community whole um, do those assessments and make those decisions um, because you are the representatives of this community and you guys are, and women are the ones that um, really make these decisions and as we've learned and as this presentation will show some of that's not necessarily straight line there are challenges to some of that 
There are hard pushes to some of that, and there's uh, key learnings that come out of that. Um, and so one of the examples of that this year was our um, addressing the referendum that was brought to the city of Batavia by residents to raise the question of home rule and the status of our community. And our role from the city staff side was somewhat dictated by uh, state law. And that was a very, very important uh, facet of communication that had to be done in a very um, uh, con confined way. Uh, the principal thing is we were not um, supposed to be engaged in advocacy. We were supposed to provide factual information. Um, that took uh, quite a bit of uh, research at times because, uh, as we all know, nowadays in the communications world, uh, it's not just a single uh, line of communication that goes on. And some of the challenges there were statements that might be made on social media or um, questions that were raised to us. So we got engaged in doing frequently asked questions about that and through Laura's direction and through Peggy's direction, we put together the documentation that really provided um, the best factual information we could uh, deliver to our community. And um, that also involved a number of FOIA um, requests and other information that um, were obviously legitimately asked by citizens who had earnest questions. And ultimately, in this room, we held a public information meeting that we tried to facilitate as objectively as possible. And um, it was somewhat an honor to play that role and field uh, the questions from citizens that were submitted right on the spot here and put them in a context where people could uh, get answers to those questions. Um, another challenging project uh, that wound up um, in two eight, 2018 was the proposed Campana project. And um, that was the subject of some of the most um, exhaustive uh, FOIA requests we've ever seen. Uh, multiple, dozens, even hundreds of emails and communications between city staff and also between our city council members and uh, both members of that organization and other members of the community. And um, we learned that basically the, that uh, generated more visits to our website by residents of Geneva, Illinois than of Batavia, Illinois, um, because it was a project that was on our border. Um, and obviously the unknown factor up here could contain a number of uh, other um, Batavia or Geneva residents, but the ones that showed up clear and sound were uh, fairly well organized and evident. Um, we also experienced an interesting and challenging um, incident this year with the fishing incident. Um, one of the challenges uh, immediately out of that event was what it actually was, because there were uh, terminology uh, there was terminology being used that was not accurate. It wasn't a hacking incident. It wasn't that someone penetrated our uh, firewall or anything like that. But um, we wound up being uh, asked questions by national organizations that uh, look into these things to find out what what did happen. And those communications are extremely important to be accurate. So we work together as a team. And uh, we tried to get out the most accurate information we could at the right timing so that we don't uh, rush information out there that might be incorrect. And of course, we got many press inquiries. Um, and then the public was obviously curious, as were our internal audience, our uh, employees, who were gravely concerned about their security. And um, some of those remain internal questions where um, our human resources department and our finance department worked together and we communicated those on an internal basis as well. You know, in a, any community these days, and it happened in my own front yard last night, uh, incidents can happen that um, there was a, a chase that involved both police and uh, some people that uh, crashed on the road out front of my home and wound up in my front yard. And that's what we're all realizing that is Batavia is one giant front yard. And of course, we've had a couple incidents this year um, in which there were um, firearms involved and uh, other incidents that involve public safety. And one of the things that uh, the city of Batavia asked me to do in my role for communications was to enroll in the incident command system training 
that uh, basically dictates um, you know, order of command in circumstances where the public safety is involved. And the benefit of that training is that you come to understand that there's real reasons why certain people need to know certain things at a certain point in time. And uh, during an incident in which the police are on scene and literally conducting the investigation, yes, the public's very curious. And yes, our council wants to know what's going on. Um, but the safety of the public, the people involved, the safety of our police officers and emergency responders comes first. And so that was a little bit of a learning experience for the city of Batavia this year. And um, we're blessed that it came out well and it's a compliment and a, uh, obviously a credit to our uh, police department in the manner in which they uh, handle these incidents. And um, we can feel great confidence in that. Um, but there's also the backside, and that's communicating with the press and getting accurate information out on a timely basis, communicating to our council members so that they can receive and respond accurately with our um, residents. And, um, you know, then there are other businesses involved in this community as well, and uh, there are some key learnings to that too. And so ultimately, we do go back out with press releases and social media and that sort of thing. Uh, but not until the time and moment is correct. Um, that also reflects upon the number of requests that we get uh, from residents and businesses and organizations. And we get uh, a lot for our community development department who are extremely busy already working on projects that are in process or looking to be improved. And meanwhile, there are requests that come in for information about properties and people inquiring about the commercial viability, or, uh, about code violations, all kinds of things that uh, they respond. And our police department also gets basically daily um, requests for police reports. Um, some of these we keep basically um, private for reasons of um, personal privacy. But the ones that are publicly available, we now post and publish for transparency purposes on the City of Batavia website. Um, some of the other aspects of communications are more proactive than maybe responsive or reactive. And so I put together a little summary of things. Um, and one of the things we really like to know is how the uh, residents and businesses uh, representatives in this community feel about how the city of Batavia is doing its job. And so at the guidance of Laura Newman, we put together a community um, <coughs> survey and Anthony Isom, her uh, assistant, um, helped administrate this. And the objective was to basically do sort of a, you know, a, um, I guess you'd call a core sample of public opinion. And we were lucky and um, I guess, uh, doing the right thing and getting more than a thousand respondents to that survey. And they came in through all sorts of channels, but ultimately we uh, put those together. We prom promoted those through web and mail and social uh, partnerships. Uh, we had a lot of collaboration from other organizations in town, and we'll talk about that a little bit. We created it all in-house, so there was no um, external um, real costs or design there. And you know, ultimately, this <laughs> survey uh, really contributed uh, to um, the strategic planning, vision, and mission statement of our community, which we'll get to in a minute. We also did um, a campaign this year that was designed more for public awareness. We weren't deep into measurement and analytics on this program. It was more about raising awareness of some of the safety issues we have with speed of traffic in town, and especially timed around the beginning of school year. So we worked with the a school district and uh, Sue Giller Lane and, and um, uh, put together a campaign and it wound up being uh, quite popular. Every one of those signs plus a small reorder went out and uh, we actually had to ultimately ask people to take them down, which is a good sign, um, no pun intended. But um, there's actually some up still in North Aurora, so we didn't, <laughs> they even expanded beyond our borders. And uh, so it wound up being um, a really interesting uh, awareness uh, program. And one of the other awareness functions that we're trying to do um, from a communication standpoint with, is in economic development. So over the past year, um, I've gone out and interviewed some 
uh, key businesses in town and now have a bank of about six case studies that are built. And the way we're using those is uh, both for affirmation of uh, inquiring businesses that are coming here. Um, they've also been really educational to our relationship with some of these businesses as we learn um, from doing these case studies, you know, what are some of your challenges and what are some of your needs? And uh, the backstories on some of these are really, really amazing. And if you read about these business owners, I think you'll be both impressed and inspired uh, by the leadership and some of the courage that they've done, you know, putting some of their life savings on the line and building these businesses up over. And the fact that El Taco Grande has been here for, you know, 26 years and now recently changed owners. And they're the fabric of our community, these businesses. And so we want to both honor and reward and also recognize them and use them to help market our city as a great place to do business. Um, one of our um, more, uh, I guess a lot of people love to know more about our fire department. Um, between the uh, videos we did both on education but also on some of their awards, you know, the one on Chris LaFleur and how he was the, you know, firefighter of the year, but he also turned around and did one on um, a new uh, item that we have in-house that is designed to help people uh, in uh, cardiac crisis. And uh, so we get a lot of views on these videos through social media and on our website. And so uh, they don't take a long time to, to uh, have the complete cooperation of the fire department. Chief Randy Dyke and a lot of their team get together. We get these done quickly and I edit them in-house. And I've gone and gotten training this year too with uh, BA TV, so we're going to do even more collaborative and raise the level of these. And some of the other ones that we have on plan uh, on deck for this year are some bike safety videos and other uh, that are in cooperation with um, these departments. Um, also spent a lot of time uh, educating the public this year on some construction projects that had a big impact on our traffic through town on Route 31 and also on the east side on Kirk. And these, uh, the engineers that direct these projects have a lot on their plates. Um, there are a lot of actual in the moment um, challenges that come up. I mean, when they start digging under these streets, we don't always know what we're going to find. And so sometimes, you know, directing traffic around those things requires real in the moment stuff. So we use a combination of the weekly newsletter, the website, social media, whatever we can do, even city alerts sometimes, to let people know that uh, we don't want them to inconvenience their lives too much. And of course, that brings us to some of the content growth that we've seen. Um, since I took the job here, we started at a Facebook level of about 2,400 um, likes, and now we're up close to 4,000. So we've seen a good growth there of 40%, and we also have 4,000 followers on Twitter. And I started up a LinkedIn page this year to begin uh, pointing toward our economic development, and we've got 100 followers already uh, going on that. So uh, while we don't have an Instagram account, we don't have a YouTube account, I, I, Right now, I feel like, uh, and the analytics sort of show, that the growth comes from concentrating your efforts in some specific and controllable areas. And when the opportunity presents itself with some tourism and stuff like that uh, down the road, and we'll get to that in a moment, uh, we may add some of those. Um, the interesting thing is what grabs the most likes and shares and things like that on our social media. And one of the big ones this year, obviously, was uh, the Batavia Steak and Shake um, incident. But another one that went great guns was this, uh, I got a call from someone and, and being a bird watcher and having all that background, someone had seen a crane got killed out on Deer Path. And I went out and basically got involved in transferring that crane to the Field Museum and that sort of thing. And the post about that uh, wound up with a huge reach and a lot of likes and shares and that sort of thing. And it sort of goes to show you that while the people care about the business of the city, they also care about events and interesting things that are going on here. And um, we're also going to get involved a little bit this in this coming year with getting some residents involved in sharing some of their experiences and their photographs and things like that so that we, um, you know, communicate the full life of Batavia. Um, I've also had the great honor to work with Mayor Schoke. And one of the projects we uh, created this year was the Then and Now project that um, shows what Batavia used to look like and what it looks now. And it really, really, uh, along with his uh, speech and commentary at the mayor's breakfast, it illustrated how much change 
has really taken place in this community in a very short period of time. And when you look back at some of the things that were here structurally just 30 or 40 years ago and that are no longer here, or this structure that we're sitting in that you know was converted into a really, really functional facility that's uh, got multiple uses, and um, there's a great testimony there. And of course, I also work a little bit with his wife, Linda, who is very active in the community and the community band and the Batavia fireworks promotion. Um, and so there's a lot of subjects here, subject matter, and we're really um, lucky to have a mayor who has such a grasp of our history. And he talks often that when he goes to other communities and talks about that, they're envious. And so we're really trying to bring some of these things to the forefront. Which brings us to the many community events with which we collaborate on. And the city of Batavia is really, really committed. These are just some of the organizations, and we'll get to that in a moment. But um, uh, monthly, on a regular basis, we have meetings between all the marketing people who uh, work for these organizations, in some cases the executive directors, who come out. We compare notes. Um, we share upcoming events, and we make sure that we promote each other's events. Um, which brings us to, you know, community pride and what a tremendous event we had this past year. Some volunteers even outside uh, these organizations, uh, including Bob Hansen at Funway and some other folks in town, uh, decided it would be a great thing to recognize the 60th anniversary of the Post to Present cover. Um, we not only had, you know, nearly a thousand people out there, but we wound up on CBS too. And, you know, I did some media pitches and that sort of thing, and we wound up with a lot of coverage. That's obviously a lot of fun. And, you know, these photographs that were taken from the top of the uh, fire department, you know, we have collaboration from the city there, too. And, of course, we work closely with Bulldogs Unleashed, and I sort of chuckle because it was outside my province as communications director, but I wound up painting two of these dogs. And it was really, really fun to get input from the various organizations in town. But if those of you who attended this event uh, will testify to the strong community feel and the excitement of all these different artists in town who designed and, and painted these dogs and how it brought to life so many aspects of Batavia. And I think that's one of the unique things about our community is we really get behind projects like this and Britta and Steve McKenna and Joanne Spitz and a lot of people behind this project were put so much energy into it and raised so much money for really, really good causes. Um, earlier this year, we completed an intergovernmental agreement with the Batavia Public Library and also a collaborative agreement with the Depot Museum um, to create this windmill app that's going to be officially launched at Windmill City Fest this year, which makes a lot of sense. You know, we've had Windmill City Days for years, and now we're actually going to celebrate the iconic symbol of our community. And um, so we're excited about that. And I really have to thank uh, Batavia Public Library and um, George Sheets and Stacy Pedersen, and also Michael uh, Kamen, who is our GIS analyst that is doing all the app work on our end. And as for the upcoming year, one of the things we, uh, that Peggy and Laura uh, really wanted to do coming into the new year was get a good snapshot to help people realize you know, where the money comes from in this community and where it goes. And of course, you're familiar with it day to day. You're making financial decisions for this community and policy decisions for this community. And so we tried to summarize that in a very cogent 18-page document that's available at cityofbatavia.net. And a lot of work went into it. There's a lot of small details that um, you have to call down to the real meaning of, of what uh, you're trying to say. But we also use this um, a document to celebrate the fact that our fire department earned this class one rating this year that in many cases actually positively impacts um, you know, the insurance rates for businesses in this community. And that's a real selling point for economic development. So I include this document along with the case studies because when brokers or, um, you know, people interested in our community are looking to move here, bring their business here, they want to know, you know, the financial foundation of this community too. Um, through the strategic planning process that City Council engaged in, so many good results came out of that. 
but also a real new look at the strategic uh, plan um, for the next, you know, um, nearly, a, you know, six, seven years, along with a vision of what we are and the mission statement, what we're going to do with these, uh, as well as post them, and we'll share them socially, uh, but we're also going to print these and put them throughout the organization so that uh, people are reminded of, you know, what we're here doing. And a big project coming up this year that I'm sure you're eager uh, to hear a little bit about is the City of Batavia website redesign. And we're really eager to do this on our end. Um, and we are, you know, collaborating uh, in internal departments. And um, you'll see uh, status as this goes. It's a very strong timeline that we work with Civic Plus on, mm -hmm. and we'll be providing you updates. But um, one of the things that I think people really uh, want to see from this project is to see more of Batavia's, uh, I guess, image and the vision of who we are, make it more visually appealing, make it um, more navigable. And so those are some of our real uh, big priorities. Um, interestingly, in the studies that uh, I've been doing in the background, uh, to learn that um, out of the visits we had this year, 119,000 were from desktop, and about uh, nearly 100,000 are from mobile devices. Now our site's already mobile ready, but I've had people um, comment to us that, well, I, I use my phone, but then I look at the desktop version. So we're gonna look at issues like that because with that many people using smart devices to access our website, we know that that's a top priority. And we also know that that's often how people like to get city alerts and that sort of thing. So we're gonna use this process to try to open these channels up, get more citizens engaged uh, in using the city uh, website uh, for everything from alerts to you know daily news updates. Um, and so one of the things that that ties together with is we not only have an internal audience here in the city of Batavia, but an external audience that we wanna bring people. And one of the strategies behind this is the while you're here sort of strategy, which is, you know, we want to let people know what's going on in terms of events, but we also want to tie those together with the existing hard, you know, infrastructure amenities we have, uh, like the Depot Museum, the Riverwalk, the Fox River, Water Street Studios, the Flag Memorial. Um, so I am involved in a lot of uh, collaborative work with those organizations, and uh, then we are talking about, um, you know, featuring some work of Batavia. Um, our artists, photographers, those kinds of things in, in that context um, to, you know, basically bring our image forward in terms of things that we're already doing. And finally, um, this all comes around to the idea, uh, and when you think all the way back to the home rule issue, you know, what is, what are people's vision and their feelings or their ideas about how they own, what their stake is in this community? And what does ownership mean? You know, ownership means understanding the value and the cost of city services. Um, and those two go together. Yes, there's a cost, but yes, there's a value. And how is that value proposition being operated on when you think about the fact that our snowplow drivers the past three weeks have been up for 24 hours a day cleaning those, clearing those streets? Do people recognize and know about those activities? So, you know, recently I got out and I rode in that truck. And I sat with those guys, and I got to see, you know, how hard it is to do that. And one of them chucklingly laughed and said, you know, this is not a, an old man's job. It's tiring. It's hard, you know. And, um, yeah, there's challenges to everything that our public works do, does, you know. Once in a while, a mailbox would get knocked down by flying snow. And there's some things you can't control, and that's also what we want people to understand. You know, it's our goal to do it right and also to make it right. And so we want to share that return on investment too in terms of what that means to this community in terms of the property values, the safe and health, uh, safety and health of this community, and ultimately the quality of life. And that's really what this communications position, you know, sort of oriented to do, is to bring that, as well as the wise use of our resources, be they financial, be they natural, you know, and then our people. And that's where the city's strategic plan and vision comes in and the planning that our um, city council and committee the whole has done. Because in the end, 
you know, we are all working together on this. And that's the importance of these, you know, communications partnerships. And you see some of the logos up there, you know, there's Batavia High School, the Park District, the Chamber, the Public Library, Main Street, BATV, Water Street, Depot Museum, United Way. You know, there's so many organizations in this town that do such great work. And um, it's our job, you know, from the city standpoint to help coordinate that. And um, I know Laura conducts, you know, frequent meetings with these community leaders uh, to see what's on their mind and see how we can help. And uh, so I'm honored to be able to help in that process. I always welcome from a personal standpoint. Um, you know, I pushed on some projects this year in the community calendar and, you know, I learned uh, from public feedback and community feedback that it wasn't everyone's vision of what they thought should be done. And so there's a learning process. There's a learning curve to this position too. And I respect those opinions and I welcome them. And uh, I think I've gotten some healthy criticism this year and I've appreciated the compliments when they come too. So the conclusion of all this is, you know, we're really trying to share the benefits of the city um, with our residents, you know, communicating our purpose and value of city services and, you know, looking for those opportunities for growth, especially on the economic development front and uh, with our city partners. And I welcome any questions if anybody has any tonight. Anybody have any questions? I'd ask if there's anything that you would like to see more of or less of in terms of what what we're doing with um, Chris's position, or is there something that we're not doing today that you would like to see us do? Um, certainly welcome any of that feedback. I'll say I like the things that are showing what our employees go through, whether it was a <coughs> snowplow ride along or you know, the, the things that the crews go through in different aspects, I think that that's Im important for people to see the, the reality of the real people that are doing the jobs that are getting paid the money that they pay in taxes and what they get from it. Mm -hmm. But seeing it on a, a personal level of seeing who's out there, who's, you know, filling the potholes, who's mm -hmm. digging the hole, mm -hmm. you know, to see the things that happen every year in the city, I think it's an eye opener for some people that just don't understand all of the services that we have pretty much are provided by people that live either real close or within the city right. that are out there at a moment's notice to go put the wires back up on Western Avenue or to fix the water main that's broken wherever, you know, at any time they're out there to do that. Mm -hmm. And you that know. they take such pride in doing right. it too. And on the pride comment too, there's also a grand amount of humility and mm -hmm. And, and all those, and some just don't want to be featured, right? you know, and I respect and that. I, and I get that, but I'm sure you can yeah. find somebody in every department. And we are. And, and, and that's we a are. good thing that I think that's something that we should continue to do mm -hmm. and maybe expand, you know, to have it every year. We plan on doing two things in different departments that really showcase what's there. Mm -hmm. I think the opportunity when we get the wastewater treatment plant done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Will be a big one because I think people really need to see what all is behind the red brick building. And one of the ones I really want to work on too is the um, our water treatment process. And I, we did do one um, uh, early last year and it needed some changes and stuff, but uh, that was fascinating to me about how that, how complicated and intense that process is. And, and completely so unseen by the public. It is, mm -hmm. and yet that water yeah, goes into right. that water tower every day and we all use it. And mm -hmm. um, it's astounding how it all takes place. So. I think that there'll be, sorry, um, some things like the dam that we need to get more information out ahead of people mm -hmm. because there's so much misinformation that floats around about our dam and our responsibilities for the dam and what would could potentially happen. So many people have, like you, Dave, have been on the council a long time. You've seen these votes come, go. You've seen all different aspects of the dam um, and why it's still in place today. I think that's something that we absolutely have to let the people know like way in advance. Mm -hmm. um, may, I, I may have missed this. Uh, two things that I'm wondering about the status of, uh, branding and monument signs for the city and whether they fall under your preview. You know, I think maybe I should respond to that because okay. the, the branding project is something that really um, predated 
Chris okay. is joining the city. Okay. Um, so I think that there are elements of what came from that, both in the conversations that that company had with our residents um, and what people identify as um, the character of their community, as well as some elements of um, verbiage and designs that they came up with that we'll be able to use um, for marketing our community, whether that be to um, visitors coming into our community, or I think it lended itself more to visitors uh, versus um, a business purpose. But I think that we will still be able to uh, create some value from what was produced from that process. Um, unfortunately, I think the origin of that process was that the um, city council was looking at monument signs. And um, in the course of the conversation about monument signs, um, the question of whether it, our brand and branding needed updating for the city came up, and so the monument signs were put on pause. Um, as a matter of fact, over the last several weeks, I have uh, myself been revisiting the question of the monument signs and thinking that um, I'd like to present to you uh, some designs for monument signs, which are um, distinctive and in their use of materials, I think that the materials of them will speak to um, the identity that we have with the community, but the the um, messaging on them will be fairly simple, but um, they they will have the what what we would be proud to see as a monument sign. And I think that's the most important thing mm -hmm. is that um, you know they they say you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Well, if our monument signs as they exist right now are a first impression of our community, that certainly isn't what I want people to think about our community, that we don't take care of things is, mm -hmm. is the way that they look right now. And so I think that if um, we were coming into our community and we saw a sign that we could feel proud about, that that's really the point of it. And so I hope to have a design that I can bring to you um, within the next two weeks to a month um, and just something for you to consider. Thank you. Yeah. I have just sort of a general question about communications. Um, mm -hmm. You say there's been a learning curve and, and whatnot over, over the year. How would you describe your relationships that you fostered with uh, TV producers or uh, local press and editors? How would you describe the relationship that you've grown over the last year? Um, it's a good question. I mean, I have, I happen to know, I mean, the local press, I know them personally, I have worked with them all. Um, so um, I've always uh, played the role of getting them the information they want. And um, I do pitch stories to them. Um, we've had some stories that come out of that. Um, Obviously, one of the challenges with local press these days is the news hole. And so some of the stories that we might like to see that are sort of positive or features benefited just don't fit into their, their province. Um, which is why, to some degree, uh, I've taken a little bit of a proactive approach in authoring some of the content we'd like to see out there on our own. And so we've leveraged opportunities um, with Kane County Connects and with some of the digital and online media. Um, on the regional basis, um, we do pitch our stories to you know, Chicago media and Chicago uh, TV. We just had a story last night run on Fabian, uh, Fabian Parkway and Route 31, and so I supervised and or orchestrated all the interviews here with Detective Michelle Langston. Um, usually I'm present for those interviews in case either our resource or their resource needs um, any assistance and that sort of thing. Um, we have some really, really good people that uh, work with our press. Um, obviously, our police department um, sometimes handles their own uh, contacts directly. I don't feel the need to oversee them. Um, they are usually informing, informative about what's going on and if, if I can provide any resources, I do. Um, you know, it's been a contraction of 
the media in this area that's been a significant challenge for us, um, which is why uh, our partners in the city of Batavia are so important, whether it's the chamber or the, you know, because you know, love it or leave it, <laughs> Facebook is a is a an information portal, and I can share with you that during the bigger events like the fishing event and like the uh, steak and shake shooting, uh, shooting and like the Campana thing, I went in and you know basically mined uh, all of that information would. Uh, transfer or communicate that to city staff if it felt like it had significance that there were answers to be done, particularly things that were affecting financial questions or community development questions, policy issues, those kinds of things. And we also utilized this year um, a software called Meltwater um, that was effective in some respects. Um, and, uh, but what we've ascertained is that uh, the concentration of our media impact is in the local media. And um, we did you know, discover certain things. <laughs> we also discovered there's a lot of con confusion between City of Batavia, Illinois, and City of Batavia, New York, which Mayor Schilke can share with <laughs> some interesting information about. But, uh, and you guys saw some of those updates you know, during the year. Um, we all only uh, have taken a little different strategy and I'm still, I built a big media list out of that software, so we're gonna go more proactive. And as you know, you were talking about trying to get the word out about the dam or uh, things like that, try to generate stories. And one of our primary focuses is gonna be on the economic development front. So I've been really researching and we attended a conference recently hosted by a big um, real estate um, sort of magazine and publisher uh, so that we could go, I could go down and meet the right people. And out of that, we, we were supposed to have a meeting today with some new leads for a law firm that represents a bunch of clients. And unfortunately, they didn't come out because of weather. But it's being engaged in uh, basically arm in arm with these departments that I think is uh, really important. Because all of the information that I distribute has to be approved and vetted by the subject matter experts internally. That could be an engineer in public works. That could be, you know, the water expert. You know, um, obviously police and fire. You know, all that sort of thing. Uh, we do get fire reports if they're in our jurisdiction and and people are asking questions. We'll post something, but we don't necessarily feel like we need to post every fire that takes place. So. I definitely does that answer your question? It does, and I, I definitely want to compliment you on growing and fostering these relationships mm -hmm. over the time that you've been here, and definitely encourage you to continue mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Um, you know, back almost 15 years ago when I was sitting out there, there were like six news outlets that used to mm -hmm. cover us. We are lucky to have a single reporter in the audience sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, there is not a lot of content being produced and so it's so important for us to start to produce our own content mm -hmm. and, and help guide guide that message so please continue that and, and yeah. find ways to foster that this year. and I uh, from that standpoint well I welcome suggestions and ideas I have a ton of them and and you know I'm digging around all the time and I sometimes just walk the streets in Batavia and talk to people uh, and I'll sit over at Daddy O's or I'll go to Limestone or I'll, you know, uh, I'm also serving on the incubator thing at the high school. And so I work with Sue out there and, you know, we've done things on the girls cross country team and that sort of thing. They view us as a, as a news outlet. So it's really, really weird that brand journalism, basically, that is us. And so, you know, I think there have been some, you know, when I post stuff, uh, about birds in the river or you know something that's going on I I see the reaction and the response I know there have been some questions what does this have to do with city business but I mentioned earlier there's three or four different kinds of resources in this town you know there's the people there's the natural resources there's some financial resources there's infrastructure and there's businesses and so I kind of look at those general categories and I try to spread it out and find in news of interest that generates engagement and, you know, I want to be at 10,000 users for the Facebook page. That's my goal. But it just takes time. And every time people react to that page, I go through and invite them all personally. So I'm really trying to pay attention to the granular aspect of what it is, because that's the only pe way people are going to feel like they're connected to us. That and I think the personalization of the residents and the people who are the resources here that are doing things that represent Batavia. And if we can highlight those and find a better way to communicate that on our new website, I think we're going to be in a lot better position. 
And I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a great opportunity, and I do plan to bring the stages of development back to you on that because I, you guys have given legitimate um, you know, criticism about some of the concerns and the volume of news and that sort of thing on there, and we, I've, we've taken those seriously. So, Chris? Marty? Yeah, I think the, um, the messaging opportunities have been really good this year on several occasions that have helped us get consistent messaging out there and consistent facts out there, just like Susan had said about the misinformation. And I think there's going to be just more opportunities for that as we go forward, where some of the sites that are out there where there's a lot of conversation mm -hmm. that could be answered very easily if they go to the city's website or if they sign up for alerts, that I think if you searched around for those hot topics or those questions that are out there, maybe not pro maybe not engage them individually as the city at that point as we've, for his role, we can, <laughs> you can run into the fray, but, but as for your role, that has seeing, been entertaining to watch. Thank you. <laughs> but seeing those opportunities and seeing those discussions out there, if you put something together that can be shared, that's just as much because then it's not us saying, well, here's how you look it up or leave room for interpretation. We're able to say, here's where it is. And then you'll start picking off people going, well, then what do I need to have it posted over here? Some of the uh, things can be done informationally or funny. Um, some of the, there you always see when we salt with the brine. Everybody's, what is this, and so on and so forth. And it's like, well, why don't you just let that, but if we had something that you can just share, mm -hmm. once that happens, there's a lot of people in the community that also get tired of reading, mm -hmm. why are we asking the same questions over and over, but being able to find that way to break through to people is just go to the city's website. Mm -hmm. The more we're sharing things, information, it's going to work and also doing it in a fun way. One of the ones for coyotes is yeah. always a large discussion, but one that stuck with me was Plainfield Police Department yeah. Yeah. did a want ad for be on the lookout for Wiley E. Coyote and let some information get out there of what to do with the coyote sighting and where to point them to. But it was done in a humorous way that mm -hmm. people love product. memes and gifts and mm. so, the more that we're able to push those things out there, <laughs> you develop the message and then just let everybody be your newspaper delivery mm -hmm. because it, that's exactly what it is. It is a source of media. And the more that we're taking people out of the um, some of the other toxic sites and actually getting the pro-productive discussions mm -hmm. is where we need to be. Thank you. And one more thing I want to ask. When you showed the one slide before with the, the numbers of, you know, different um, things that were used to access the website, do we have numbers from years past of how many website visits we had compared to the hundred or 300,000? Yeah, going visited? back. Um, I mean, has it gone up steadily a percentage or? Well, that's a good question. So we do have those numbers. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the questions I really put to Civic Plus, I said, you know, how are we doing compared to other cities of our size? And so it's generally um, somewhere around 240 to 300,000 visits per year. And for a city our size, she said that's really good because it runs from one, like one, the mid range is 140 to like 200 and then 200 to 240 and that sort of thing. So we're doing okay. Is that great? I'm like, well, you know, wouldn't it be better if it was 500? But one of the other things I've seen is some of our traffic is so random. Like, um, <laughs> I looked at some of the towns that we, why is there 2,000 visits from, you know, some town in Missouri? I, I mean, that takes a lot of digging down to figure out why that is. Is there some sort of bot that's doing that? You know, so you, you got to be sort of careful with statistics, raw statistics. Mm -hmm. I don't think they always tell the full and true story, uh, but I have been digging down in order to, to look at that, even down to you know, like single pages. Yeah. And one of the things we learned was that you know our our employment page is one of the top mm -hmm. pages. Search. 
Mm. Yeah, I guess my big thing was it just, you know, did we have 100,000 five years ago and now we've got 250,000? I think we've been growing slowly, slowly but it, it's not some like, you know, it's not the okay. it's not the hockey stick. It, like My other thought was is then to look at it a year or two after we've done a website redo. Oh, see well, we'll have that much better to or how much work, you know, what the difference is after we try to make it better. And then the other process that we're going to go into with the uh, our search engine optimization and our page count and the content, the type of content that's on there. I've written SEO content in the past, but mostly, you know, is the content current? Is it being updated? You know, that sort of thing. So, I mean, the website search engines look at your site from a whole variety of different perspectives. And so one of the challenges for us is, uh, you know, to stay sort of rapid and current and fresh. Um, but fortunately, we do have a lot of content that rotates fairly frequently. So, um, but things like blogs and things like that can be helpful if done right. Yeah. Just one quick add on, on geography. Mm -hmm. um, I live in Batavia, but I'm in also, I'm in Geneva Township. Mm -hmm. My router shows up as Geneva, so a very large part of my ward is going to show up as Geneva Hits yeah. if they visit from your site. Whether that's skewing the numbers or Well, not, it would. It would. That might be part of it. You know, that's a, but they're good things to know. Yeah. You know, and everything I do, I say, always try to get the information. <laughs> then you can make decisions. So... I just wanted to say that coming into a job mm -hmm. with in Batavia, that any organization where it's never existed before is a real challenge. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you, the way you've developed the um, position and um, grown with it, is pretty remarkable. Well, thank and you. So, um, it, in in a real short period of time. I moved here in '85 and lived across from Mayor Shoki's father. And then I sold ads in this town for the Chronicle, and then I became the chamber president, a rotary president. And so I feel like I have a long history here. And well, it is, it's scary long. And, um, and I do love this town. And, um, you know, it's been a learning experience too, because there's a lot of strong, intelligent people at work in this town who have really, really good ideas, who work together. And, you know, sometimes your ideas need to be put through the mill. You know, so some of that is really, really good. And I don't care how experienced or inexperienced you are, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I've appreciated patience and I appreciated people's guidance and commentary. And uh, it was a really interesting year last year with everything going on. And um, there wasn't really a day when you come in to this job and go, oh, I don't know what I need to do today, because it would usually be <laughs> greeting you in the door. And that's a pretty cool job to have, and it's an honor to have it. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Very, very informative. Thank you. Laura? Um, there are just a couple of things that I'd like to let everybody uh, know about that are going on. Um, based on the discussion that we had about um, bike safety in our community, um, members of staff in the Bike Commission are going to get together this Friday to discuss um, creating an educational campaign for bike safety. Um, probably going to result in producing um, some type of video and maybe some other companion materials with that. I'm sure that Chris Cudworth will be deeply involved in that, being both the communication coordinator and an avid cyclist. Um, also, can I step? Can I answer sure. a question about this? Where will there be any um, suggestions as to safe routes to ride? I mean, there's a lot about yes. crossing street safety and that sort of thing. But I don't know that people really know how to ride across town, how to ride to the grade schools, how to ride down to the river path. So I think that would be helpful. Yes, I think that, in fact, um, one of the things we're going to do together is um, we have a downloaded a, a seminar um, that is about the um, most recent and, and best practices in creating paths through your downtown, and we're going to watch it together. Um, the Community Development Department, Public Works, um, 
Chris and I, the Bike Commission, all of us together, because as you know, we have been having several conversations over the course of the last year about what is the best path, best paths through our downtown area for pedestrians, for bicyclists. And then once we know what those paths are and the way that we want to guide people safely through the community, then we also are working with Main Street on creating wayfinding so that people are aware of all of the great amenities that we have that they can visit by bike, on foot. And so all of those things are going to weave um, together. And so I'm really looking forward to the conversations that we might start on Friday um, and hopefully we'll build into exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Sure. The other thing that we have talked about is uh, wanting to know a status on where things are at with regard to our collaboration with the park district on um, planning for our riverfront. And uh, last week we met with the park district and um, one of the things that we're looking at is rather than uh, reinvent the wheel by ourselves, uh, we have friends to the north in St. Charles who did uh, tremendous work and actually with a local foundation. Um, and we want to meet with the representatives from that foundation, um, both to talk about what their experience was in undertaking such a large project of planning the whole future of the riverfront up in St. Charles, but also to look at some of the documents that they utilized along the way, like a ref uh, request for qualification from some of the professionals that they worked with on that project. And then also um, their uh, reference with regard to those professionals that they worked with. We know of some, some other people as well, but we thought that might be a good starting point was to learn from our friends from uh, to the north. Um, and then also we had a meeting here on Monday and it was sponsored by Batavia Main Street and um, they had brought in a consultant from the National Main Street Organization. And the purpose of those meetings was to have a discussion about um, having a transformational strategy for the future of our downtown district. And it was uh, a lot of very good conversations among many stakeholders in our community, um, collaborated on coming up with some recommendations that are very specific for potato. And so I've invited Chris Faber, um, the executive director of Main Street, to come here and tell us about the process and the results of that process. Uh, I think it's something very interesting for the whole community to work on um, together. Our future um, annual update reports from department heads in case people are interested in tuning in or attending on February 26th will be our finance department and our information systems department. On uh, March 5th will be public works. On March 12th, community development and economic development. And on March 19th, uh, human resources, the police department and fire department. And that's all I have unless somebody has any questions for me. Lucy. I have another question. What are the issues um, for the Prairie State Lobby Day? What are, do we know what they're going to be lobbying about? Uh, there are bills before the state having to do with like sales tax on mining equipment, also taxing issues, uh, enterprise zone issues, um, state controlled MSHA, which is the Mine Safety and, and Health Administration issues. And really, it's also, besides the, the technical aspects, the, the, the legislative and, 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 and those aspects, it's also, there are a number of new legislators that they just want to get exposed to Prairie State and say, you know, we are an important um, job, you know, job generator in the downstate, several hundred jobs, and important to the economy, generating lots of uh, you know, revenue to the local local and downstate economy. So that's kind of the, the second aspect of it. Do they have a position statement kind of like? They will, and I, I, haven't, I haven't gotten that to you guys yet because I haven't seen it yet. But yes, that'll all be coming out and very specific as to what, what, what's going to be talked about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Scott, I got uh, one question for you. If you could help me with this a little bit. I, I don't know if, you, if you've been getting any phone calls or not, but we're hopefully going to see some activity coming up soon at the old Avenue Chevrolet property. Mm -hmm. 
and so I've been getting some questions on what exactly is going in there and what's the time frame and besides the fact that there's one restaurant plan what else are the plans and I don't know if there's anything you can share on that sure yeah the uh, proposal is going in front of the plan commission on February 20th uh, for public hearing uh, essentially what the, what the proposal is is to divide the original Avenue Chevy parcel into four parcels uh, one of which would be a site of a fast food restaurant called Raising Cane's. Uh, there's one in Aurora right now and Harwood Heights and a couple other places in Chicago. So it's a fast food chicken uh, style restaurant. So uh, they're being proposed on one of the outlots. One of the outlots would be the driveway access into the development. And then one, there's another outlot that would be on McKee that's yet to be determined on what that's going to be for. The bulk of the site, about six acres or so, would be a future outlot that would be for some kind of development. There are no plans for any of that at this time. So um, essentially the subdivision would happen. Um, they would be doing a plan development. Um, there would be some variances for setbacks and some other you know, zoning code uh, deviations uh, and then design review for the Raising Cane's restaurant itself. So um, that's proposed for the uh, February 20th plan commission and then that will obviously come to the Committee of the Whole and the City Council. Uh, for for final approval so I know there were some questions about you know from so at least one resident about some of the notices and everything else that were out there uh, I think we've clarified that that you know it is not an annexation it's already in the city limits uh, there is no annexation agreement or anything required for that um, but they would be getting uh, plan commission approval for the plan development subdivision and then uh, design review as part of that and who did you say was developing it I'm sorry uh, Kensington Development is the developer. They're, I think they have their signs out there right now. So do they? Okay. They do, yeah. So the the restaurant that is being proposed is closest to the corner itself. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right well, next. Right to now, the there's nothing other than a resubdivision. Mm -hmm. There's nothing planned for as you get closer to the residents of the subdivision. Not at this time. There's not. No. <laughs> Dave, if if anybody is interested in the restaurant, you can go visit it tonight. Uh, there is a Chick Fil A on Route 59 in front of Fox Valley Restaurant, on, right at New York and 59. And this is kind of like Burger King chasing McDonald's mm -hmm. because uh, apparently Raising Cane is the Burger King of the chicken world. Mm -hmm. And so where there's the Chick-fil-A, they want a Raising Cane. Mm -hmm. And so they want to be right across the street from the <laughs> business that's on the <laughs> southwest corner at McKee and Randall. So, mm -hmm. you know, I get told this and it catches my curiosity. <laughs> so I say to my wife, you know, I'm not really that much of in for chicken fingers, but I think I'd like to go down and check out this restaurant. Mm -hmm. So we get in the car and we drive down to 59, right across the street from Fox Valley. And here's this brand new, very nice appearing, well maintained, very clean restaurant. And so I get out of the car and we go in there and here's this place jam packed. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly, it seemed like it was mostly grandparents who were babysitting their grandchildren. <laughs> and it was all these little kids in there. And the deal as I could tell it was, is that you went in and they basically, they didn't, they don't sell much other than chicken fingers. Mm -hmm. That's what they sell. It's chicken and it's got some kind of a coating on it. I guess maybe there's a couple of kind of coatings. But then they sell you along with it, you get this this tray of dips and you, they're all covered up and you take your plastic cover over them and then you take these chicken fingers and you dip these things into mayonnaise and ketchup and all this kind of stuff and you just eat these to the, you get full. <laughs> and this place, I was visibly impressed by the volume of business that this place had going with this idea. So when the folks came in here and briefly <coughs> had a conversation with me, they're telling me that the, the demographics of the Tri-Cities are right in their face. I mean, they are exactly what they're looking for. And we got all kinds of grandparents around here that want to take somebody for a treat or whatever it is. And there's all kinds of parents that want to go. And they pride themselves on a very, very clean, very modernistic, approach to this, but they they know that there's a lot of chicken fanciers and when they can put themselves across the street from the Chick-fil-A that people know is already there, they got a ready customer probably right on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll come over and try them at least once or twice and see what's going on with this kid thing that's going on. In this <laughs> so I, you know, I think if you bring it in here, it will be well received and it will really be rolling uh, as a, as a, 
eatery in Batavia. Thank you. Susan? Um, I think to the mayor's point and, and the questions about what could potentially be going on that property in addition to Raisin Cane, <clears throat> I watch the comments with great interest whenever there's a new announcement and Marty shared, you know, that the four restaurants are coming to town and Mark Foster had written a really good article about it. What is, it, there's two things I find very, very interesting about social media. The first is that citizens think we control what comes into town. And so they say, why is the city putting a raising cane across the street from Chick-fil-A? Which is just so interesting to me, considering we have nothing to do with it. Um, but it's, it's something that we regularly see. Why, why is the city putting in another pizza restaurant? Why is the city doing this? So I think that there needs to be some clarity around what uh, economic development in, our, in a town does. And it's not hand selecting the businesses to come in. I think that that you, is really you didn't interesting. Pick the four Thai restaurants? I didn't. Know? I didn't, or the Mexican restaurants or anything. Do so you mean the market sorts that out? It, for some reason, it's a self correcting thing, but unbeknownst <laughs> to the people, of Batavia, the city of Batavia proper doesn't pick those things. And then the second thing that I have uh, noticed in the last probably two years is that social media can make or break any business in town. And it, it, it's very upsetting to me because people will put out a comment about someone will just say, have you ever been to, and then fill in the blank, whatever restaurant or any establishment in town. And people for some unknown reason, um, people will just bash it to death. And, and some people will chime in and say, oh, no, I've been there and it's great. And other people will just drive it into the ground. And I don't think they realize that what they're doing is hurting a small business, someone who has put their blood, sweat, and tears, and most importantly, money on the line to create a business in our community. And so um, I, I liken it to back in the day where you could write a letter to the editor and complain about something, but now it's at the speed of light. You used to have to you know, find a, a piece of paper and a pen and a stamp and an envelope and, and get it into the mailbox. And now it happens immediately. Well, Dave still does that. Um, but, <laughs> but now it happens instantaneously. And, and it, it, it really upsets me because um, our economic development people, the, the city, the businesses, the, the chamber, Main Street, everyone works really hard to foster this um, sense of a great community. So when people take to social media and just bash businesses, you know, it's all I can do not to just really type back nastily. But I just, I, I would really like people to stop and think before they, before they post. I, I it just, it, it, it's, it, it's getting worse and worse and worse. I see it on a daily basis, and and it's it's very unsettling. Well, thank you for your editorial. Not, not a problem. But I do believe the mayor's got some city business he wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. so you I don't know about this. city business, but kind of picking up on the conversation here in the moment. Uh, this, after, this morning, this afternoon, I guess it was, uh, the mayor of St. Charles and the mayor of Geneva and the mayor of Elburn and the city administrator of South Elgin because the mayor's a barber and couldn't leave his work and myself all put on a uh, five-minute presentation about what's happening in our towns to the uh, Fox Valley Council of Women Realtors. It was up in Geneva. And it was very interesting to hear what everybody had to say. And I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's, specifically in the Tri-City area, there is a lot of new housing. I mean, there's a variety of new houses coming in. So. I picked up on that because when I was in, I've been, I've been in Chicago a lot in the last few weeks, and I was in there recently, and I was in CMAP, and they had a couple of the people from the Census Bureau in there chit-chatting chit with us. And they are saying that there are certain towns that they really are very interested in what the trends are and what's happening. And the Tri-Cities is one of the areas of the region that they watch very, very strongly because they... They think it's a bellwether for what really is going to be happening in a lot of other places in the region, some good, some bad. We're on the good side of the market as far as the age of the people that's moving in, the education of the people that's moving in. Uh, are they commuters? Are they stay at home? Do they work on the computer? There's a lot of interesting numbers that are coming out, and we've already been at 
visited by the Census Bureau, and Laura and I met with them, and they had, you know, she was a nice enough gal, but I think I got the message from her that they really want to have kind of an intense census taken on Batavia because they really want to know what our, what's going on here, what our income levels are. You know, there's a bunch of stuff that they find is, is uh, kind of the model for the area. So, you know, I think that's a role that we're wearing. And so because of that, you start picking up a lot of other people have an interest in you about what's going on. So to kind of compound that, I just want to share with you that I was notified last week by Fermi Lab that they're going to have a uh, basically an, a, some kind of an activity out there in March to officially kick into place this building of this new accelerator. Now, what you have to appreciate about the new accelerator is it's right in Batavia's face. It's going to be built right along the east side of Kirk Road, immediately south of the Pine Street entrance, and it'll go all the way down to where the bike bridge goes over Kirk Road there on the old Chicago Roar and Elgin Railroad right away. And that's where most of this construction for this new facility is going to be right there now. They've got, it's going to be over a billion dollars they're going to spend there, and they've got a lot of foreign investment. That's the kind of the new twist on this thing is, is that a number of the foreign, <coughs> foreign governments want to be part of this whole research on this neutron as where it's going and whatever. So uh, I guess we as the country have made the decision to pay for it. We're going to invite everybody else in the world to come in here and help us. And I guess it's been warmly received and they've gotten quite a few commitments by the rest of the world to come into Fermilab and, and, and spend money and do stuff. So when I'm chit-chatting with the women of realtors this afternoon, several of them mentioned to me, you know, we, we've started, and I guess in my own thing up at Baird Warner in St. Geneva, I, I've heard this too. We're getting inquiries from people wanting to talk about buying certain types of housing in Batavia or investing in, in certain types of housing. And the thing that seems to be very interesting, I guess, to maybe some of the foreign nations that are now looking in the market is what kind of a quote-unquote condo space do you have in Batavia? You know, something that we could buy and we could maybe move four visiting scientists in for six months or a year, and then when their experiment's done, we move them out, we keep the place, and we move somebody else in. And we want something that's probably got inside parking and maybe security and sprinklers and near walking areas to downtown and whatever have you. So then I have conversations with some of these folks that are looking at opening restaurants in downtown Batavia. And you know, what is the driving force behind that activity? Why are they interested? And they're saying to me, well, you know, there's some interesting things being discussed in Batavia, specifically the Shodin project, or there's, you know, I think something's gonna happen over at the old Chase Bank lot on South Batavia Avenue. I think I told you last meeting, I spent some money for, and reproduced a bunch of old photographs for the folks who are proposing to develop that because they need to have a kind of a history of what the environmental uses on that property has been over there for many years. So there's a lot of people kicking tires here right now. And so, you know, I, I guess I would suggest to you that when we get into any of these discussions, and they're probably not very far away as far as, you know, what type of housing type styles are we going to allow in Batavia? And I guess I'm talking about Shodine and probably this deal on South Batavia Avenue, and maybe there's another one, I'm told. Uh, you know, we're going to have to again have this discussion about, well, do we want to have housing that doesn't have a backyard and it's all people living here? I mean, I've had some people, I'm not going to say who, but some very prominent residents say to me, you know, I wish we had a, a, a nice condo in town where I could buy it and move in there and then maybe for three months a year I could go to Florida or Arizona right after Christmas and just lock the door and then be able to come back and then if something with my family's going on I can come back anytime and just move, come back and be here for a couple, three days and then go back to wherever it is I'm going to go. But right now in Batavia we really don't have that I'm being told and I think that's probably a, a true assessment. So. You know, as we, as we, as I guess what I'm telling you is, uh, you're going to have some interesting conversations here in the next few months as we begin to embark upon yet another conversation about 
what type of housing are we going to have in Batavia. Now, another thing I would tell you is because I'm in Chicago and I'm in there with all these other mayors because they're in there looking for federal money that's no longer around because it's, right now state and federal money is almost totally disappeared. Certainly the state has. But you go, so I get to chit chat with some of these other mayors in the area that have already done some significant in densified housing in their downtown areas. And you want names, I'll say, you know, Elmhurst, Downers Grove, uh, Western Springs, Wheaton, Glen Ellen, uh, Naperville. I mean, there's a bunch of them out there that have done this now. And you say, you know, what's, what, what's the story here? And the first thing most of them will tell me, I had a nice talk with the mayor of Downers Grove. He says, well, you got to appreciate it. I, we got hellfire and damnation about it. There was all kinds of people didn't want it. It was going to ruin the town, and we didn't want this type of house in the downtown. He says, now they're, they're, they're filling up pretty quick. And he says, the nice part about it is they bring one heck of a great property tax with them. Uh, that it's a, you've got all this density piled on top of everything, and it's in the downtown, which generally has a fairly decent assessed valuation to it already. And you add that commodity to it, and he says, you know, and towns that don't have a lot of room to add new housing to their community, they're not like us where we can build 242 townhouses on Kirk Road or 201 out of McKee and Randall. Uh, they don't, a lot of those places don't have that, just don't have the land to do that. So by bringing this density in there, suddenly there's people that like it are people like the school district which suddenly is going to be getting these nice big tax checks off of these things because you now have this. And as several of the mayors in there have said to me, what you got going here is, is you know, it's not all new people moving in here. I got a lot of my older residents that their children and their grandchildren are in my town and they don't want to leave my town. They want to be right here with the family. They want to be able to have the access but maybe leave for a couple months. But they really want this. So some of the best customers we got for this are your own local residents who say, and then that opens up the opportunity for them to put their 50-year-old house on the market and then some young couple comes in and wants to buy that because then they can <coughs> get their kids into the local school system. And so the other commodity that comes to play here is how good is the perceptions of the Batavia school system? Now there's probably none of us in this room that will argue that, man, you get that property tax bill every year and you see that big bite that the Batavia School District has taken out of you. And I think every one of us, including myself, we all kind of cringe and oh my goodness gracious. But quite frankly, on the other side of the coin, that school district and the record it has is probably the number one anchor tenant of the real of why people want to move. If you say, what's the best reason that most people want to move in here? It's because of the perceptions and the test scores and the educational graduation rates of how many are going to college and whatever have you that you find in Batavia schools. And then the other thing is if you sit here and, like I do and, and uh, get to know some of the folks that are getting involved specifically at the elementary level. I mean, man, you talk about some people that become zealots for, for schools. And I will tell you, we got six of them, in, well, six public schools in town and each one of these public schools has some, <clears throat> some passionate believers in what's going on in those educate in those classrooms in these elementary schools. And I've had people that have been stood at this podium here in the last year or two and protested something or another and were mad at me or mad at you or mad at the city. But then when push comes to shove, I'm having another conversation with them about something else. And all of a sudden they're telling me, well, I don't like the taxes either, but man, I got a great school system, and man, I just like my teachers, and I like this program, and I, you know, I'm paying for it, and it's, but it's worth it to me to have my kids in this school system. So I had my friends out from Melrose Park last week, and they, we told them about it, and now they want to move into Batavia, and they want to find a house. So there's a thing going on here that is pretty significant as far as people wanting to move in here, and it's a variety of things, as I think I've just shared with you, whether it's the condo deal, or it's buying the older house and restoring it, or you know, whatever else. You know, our friends down at Mooseheart got the permission we gave them with that 494-acre development down there. They can build 830 age-restricted living units down there on that property at some future date. So we got a variety of things, and 
you know, I, I, Laura and I have talked a couple times here. I think it's very important that all of you come to these meetings that we're having with our department heads because some of these department heads, from an operational standpoint, be it public works or police and fire, really, I think, are going to get tested by what's going to happen here with the number of people that want to hook onto the sewer and water and the number of people that want to call for the ambulance or the police car or the fire truck. And, you know, I, I don't think we can lay, sit here and let our department employment levels stay where they are. With all, If all this stuff really starts to happen, and with this Fermilab now thing about to kick in and some other stuff going on here, I think we're going to be pressurized to try to take some actions to add, to start adding some more people here. And hopefully, you know, we have not gone crazy with that in the past, and I think we've got our employee levels pretty good, but we're, we, we're in some of these departments we're going to have to add some people. <coughs> Uh, Your Honor, I'm just curious. It, it has been a few years since we started looking at the Shodian project. Are you suggesting the market has changed enough that that could accelerate condominiums in that building? I think there's a very strong interest by it. You know, I've, that, that's what people ask me is, you know, are, it, can I go in there and buy one? That's what I want. And I think Shodian certainly is open to that idea. He was just going to rent them to begin with, but I think he could... You know, and maybe we can also, if you want, have a conversation with him about what he's doing on the first floor on Wilson Street. He's now we got two new restaurants wanting to move in, so they're right there next to it. You know, maybe that sends the message that maybe there's some room for some more retail in there. So I you mean, know. even an awkward door could not prevent a restaurant from going in. Yeah, pardon. Me? An awkward door on Wilson Street <laughs> might not prevent a restaurant from going in. No. Okay, <laughs> we'd love to revisit that. So I mean, I'm just telling you that it, 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 I think this is going to be an interesting year of conversation. <laughs> But it's positive. It's not like I'm sitting here now. I could tell you when I'm in Chicago, there's about 38 towns in the region that are in very, very, very rough shape. And they're not even sure they're going to be a town in another year or so. I mean, and then I think one of the things that the new governor may have to look at is what he's going to do to reinvent some places that may basically just say, I'm imploding. I don't have money to put the cops and the firemen on the street anymore. And I got blocks with... 20 houses and nobody's living in them, maybe a squatter or something, but, you know, my property values are, are hit the floor and the houses that are still being lived in are taxed to the hilt because they're the only people that are in town paying the bill. And so things are really going south on me here. And so we need to change something. So, you know, you got places like that that are going to be saying, they're the opposite. You know, they can't keep employees because they don't have any, any money to pay them because there's no taxes coming in. Well, we got the other side of this thing. We're in a good place here because we got people feeling good about the place, people wanting to move in here, and people looking for a variety of housing styles to come into Batavia. Thank you. I don't mean to preach, nope, but I guess that's my role. It's always, always good to hear. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? Motion to do it. Marty has something. Sorry, Marty. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up an article from strong towns and if anybody's not subscribed to them or following them make sure that you are because there's a lot of a lot of uh, articles that kind of mirror what's going on in our town and I bring up an article that was reshared again this week it was regarding the low-cost pop-up shops in Muskegon I know I shared that with people mm -hmm. sent it to other people and it was very intrigued by the way the article and the details of it Sometimes all it takes is a little push to get something rolling, and that's what Muskegon did when they invested in low-cost, small-scale businesses in the downtown. And it kind of talks about their downtown, how their uh, marker, f farmer's market is booming, new retail is going in, and there was just a lot of equal uh, comparisons between there and here. And then I got thinking about, you know, well, where would we do something like that? Because if somebody's got a good idea, we're going to plagiarize it, obviously. That's the great American tradition behind Susan's. People love to bring somebody up just to tear them down. That's the national pastime. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but, so I was looking at the article and reading it, but the thing that struck me the most is the, the visuals of it. And like the original photo that was shared with me regarding the community dinner, community dinner, 
that was purely based, somebody shared and said, can we do this here? And I'm like, oh, absolutely, because I could see it. And to Chris's presentation, two of those pictures are in there mm -hmm. about that because it speaks to what we, what we envision our community. So when I was looking at those pictures, I'm like, oh, that's totally here. I totally could see it. These small little houses, small little structures, she sheds for the State Farm people <laughs> that, <laughs> that would go in the downtown. Well, where would we put it? And I was joking with Susan because it would be the big back door, but we've got a city lot mm -hmm. that just visually I go, I can totally 100% see it there. It also goes with the vision that Dave's been talking about for River Street ever since the original conception. It will increase the flow of traffic further up the road incrementally. And that's how you do things so that it's a success. And that lot wouldn't have to be paved. Got a parking lot that's right there. We could put some gravel um, paths in there, put a couple <laughs> of these units on there for minimal cost charge rent, all those kind of details would still have to be worked out. Um, but it's also not when we were talking about, whoa, well, what about this? And it's like, well, let's not overthink this because we have the popcorn depot as an example. That's, we already have that here. So it's not outside of the realm of possibilities for, for failure, but it would just be like Dave point to me was saying, well, who's going to run it? Who's going to manage it? The good thing is, is the city owns the lot. We have an, an entity in town designed to the downtown for Main Street. I wanted to see if there was interest in directing Anthony at a Main Street level to initiate conversation with him. I know that uh, Chris Faber is very interested in it too. But I wanted to give more direction and feel what everybody here thinks about an idea at least worth exploring. I think it's an interesting idea. Um, I mean, I think of the amount of money that the city put in from the TIF district into Water Street Studios, and basically that's 30-plus mm -hmm. businesses inside of one building there that we invested in. I think it's one of the best, I think it was hundred and eighty thousand dollars or whatever the total is that we've invested in that over the time that we directly put towards that I, I think it in this situation if we could find out more about how they administer it up there I mean I think it's a neat little idea I've got some friends up there that talk about it all the time um, I think it's something that if there's not a huge oversight and management setup that we have to have or devote staff time to I think it's something to really look at because I think that that's you know we spend 50 grand on it and it becomes a self-supporting entity in town that can bring more business and bring more people in here we always talk about how we have to figure out how to capture all the bicyclists <laughs> well, if it's right next to the bike path or right near yep. where the bike path makes turns it's a perfect place for it and also that might show somebody as a developer that wow this is really a good area right here let's see if we can buy that piece of property from the city and put a real building there. And to kind of go with that, that's why I was thinking just the location of it, right next to the yeah. bridge, it's, there's parking. It just, it just when you yeah. don't overthink it, you just go, it fits. Right. And then when you're saying we're, we're spending twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, whatever the number that actually right. is, to build those structures. We already own the land. It would be minimal uh, infrastructure improvements. But then the, the value of those units, when they're done, you sell them so you still have tangible assets and now you have very small electrical user which would not even be minimal but the sales tax that could generate from that is only significant in that it creates more walking and destination for people to go to they're going to eat they're going to go oh let me check out this cute little shop they're not going to spend hours shopping there but it would be a high turnover quick sale initial small business incubators which we also learned is very successful in this community we just have to be I, I, sorry um could i ask a question now do these can you pick them up and move them afterwards is that it i would assume that's exactly they, like it like any normal shed yeah. mm -hmm. that you wouldn't permanently mount it because it wouldn't be a permanent fixture 
so that they can be you just put a whatever the building permits for those would allow i just um, i mean i'm not sure what the difference is like i know matt knowles wanted to put a build, uh, business up sure. there and we were like whoa we don't want to tie this up in case another oh, developer no they're that like was eight by eight little yeah. tiny buildings no that was for the um yeah well the, i know it wasn't garage. in the same spot but still the idea was well if a developer comes in will this discourage the developer so you know and we we wanted to keep that open so i don't mm -hmm. know just, just it's the envision it's, something like marty said the popcorn stand it's the location in the land of that size right. maybe a little okay. bit larger it's more of a new pop -up incubator thing. business yep. yeah pop-up so, and then you can in. move them later maybe it could yep. be yep. an extension to the farmer's <laughs> market where or some of the people that come to the farmer's market would maybe want to have their business establishment open permanently on tuesdays and thursdays yep. along with saturday and sunday and maybe all 52 weeks of the year something like that i think it's a great idea picture chris kindle yeah. kindle, kindle market I, uh, yeah. that okay. kind of thing one yep. of the but things little, i said to marty when we first started talking about it was i don't know how we're going to get the building department and the fire department to back down on it so <laughs> we could actually do something like this and he says you know he had a great response i gotta hand it to marty he's put a lot of thought into this was we already got precedents we've got the, the popcorn stand mm -hmm. and it right. works you the, know, the we're not thing. building a permanent structure here. This is something that's going to go up to mm -hmm. see how we would, how it works. Yep. How many other businesses can be generated <coughs> in town from this? Mm -hmm. And you know what? If it fails in four or five years. There's a lot of other things we've done that would be helpful. And, and, and Gary's sitting back there thinking electricity <laughs> to right. ten little houses <coughs> and start small. <laughs> and, 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 then, and then there's the topography of it too because it slopes downhill quite a bit oh you can walk to it we will remain open-minded as well, well a lot of those things were grading. discussions about this yeah. well and that's why don't overthink it when we were originally planning for the shutting down the road and you start thinking about all the logistics it could have gone it's insurmountable forget it but the vision of it just being able to close your eyes picturing Yep, that can happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why now look at, because then what we did with the initial community dinner was turn it over to other people, let them build it, and it keeps growing every year. As a result of it, because you work out the initial kinks in it, you learn from your mistakes. We have comparables in this town, and we have success stories in Muskegon and the Finger Lakes region and other ones that people were. Oh, all over. It's everywhere. not a yeah. it's not a unique idea, but it's an idea that I know, just from reading it, and the gut feeling is which a lot of decisions initially go with oh, for sure. starting the discussion is yep i can see it here i could see six little cottages there easily i think it it would easily fit six as i walk by it and look at it you know i think it they'd be cute little <coughs> tiny cottages i think it'd be adorable although i did have one person suggest and i think it would be a fantastic idea that one of them would be a mattress firm and we would just put a twin mattress in you, there you had a that's it that's how to go there. <laughs> wow. Mattress from and a dispenser. Oh, yep. yeah. absolutely. Easy. <laughs> it's not legal. Mm -hmm. Same. Mm -hmm. So, so farmers. That was so, it. Are you yeah. asking? Yeah, them just to just to, for if there was other people that would I, just say, let's absolutely. direct sure. steps to have Anthony, and have Anthony, Anthony and probably Nick it. since he's on the board. And I would, also, just I would say put no, no limitations on the discussion. I would be open to hearing, is there other, other right. city yep. parcels around town where you could put something? I'd be interested to hear what they could, well, what they could so do. Just start the conversation. And yeah. I think there's a strong yep. messaging with this, too, about having a really strong push for promoting small business startups. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. That, right. that does mistake. not exist in many, many other places. If we put 50 grand into it and every year one new business comes out of that space sure. that goes from the basement brewery to now a brewery, you know, now a, a beer sales once a month over here to probably moving into another building and actually having a group of or mm -hmm. a brewery in town, that's huge in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. So this can make those kind of things happen. Be a good thing, old Marty. Could, could you pull that that article to me? I, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah, I'll send it to everybody, please. Okay, good. Anybody have anything else? Motion okay. to adjourn. Someone second. Motion by Salvati, second by Meisler. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.